again, thank you all so much for coming out. So by way of introductions, uh, my name is Leah Shinkuski. I'm the producer for the Dragon Age Keep. Um, I've been on the project, uh, really I joined BioWare to help build the Keep and it's just been an amazing project and something I've been incredibly passionate about. So really happy to represent and kind of talk to you today about the Keep. So in terms of what we'll learn, the, really the focus of this is to tackle the technical cross-platform challenge and kind of how our team at BioWare uh, got around this, as well as we really feel like we created an amazing web experience for players and something that we hope that you can also accomplish no matter what size your team is. is we were a relatively small internal team at BioWare uh, in the online services department as well as work with your community to develop better products with a built-in following. So we actually had a community beta program that really took us from what was an idea or concept and helped us get there. So we'll kind of give you some tools and tips as to how we did that. So in terms of the presentation outline, we'll take you through sort of the driving force behind this and choice and why choice matters and why we decided to tackle this and how we uh, went through this looking at the save game challenge, developing what we call the world vault, which is the system that stores all those plot choices uh, for the future. As well, uh, the franchise ecosystem is another piece that we'd like to talk about. It's kind of the way that we uh, started to look at both the challenge and then translate it into the player experience using the tapestry and the interactive story summary. The Keep has a few more features, uh, but this is kind of the focus of our presentation. As well, we'll take you through our community beta program and kind of show you how the Keep progressed with that feedback. And then just some closing thoughts uh, to wrap up. So let's get started. Choice matters. So for a bit of background, I want to talk about choice. Choice is really a key pillar for Bioware games and RPG games in general. And Dragon Age is no uh, exception to this. So over hundreds of hours of gameplay, players have shaped and become very attached to their Dragon Age universe. And historically, all these choices have been stored in a single local save game file. I love this quote because it kind of looks at how difficult it was to make decisions across the franchises and really how much uh, emotion and meaning people put into the choices being made. So that really brings us to the save game challenge. But first, a bit of history. So Dragon Age Origins launched in 2009, and we had 2010 uh, Awakenings came out, but then finally when we started on Dragon Age 2 is where, oops, sorry, these transitions are a little finicky. Okay, go, yes. So starting on Dragon Age 2 is when the challenges really began to show up. It quickly became apparent that there were problems in the save import system and that it was impossible to obviously move to a new platform. Characters that should have been dead magically reappeared, the choices you made were overturned, and really it's the import logic that was kind of the Achilles heel of the system. And of course this made fans somewhat uh, upset. And, you know, over hundreds of hours of gameplay, that makes a lot of sense. So what we wanted to do is look at traditional save game import and say, okay, what are the problems here? Well, first off, errors are inevitable. Here's kind of the mapping of the plot. Actually, it's sort of one of the clusters of the plot systems, and it's incredibly complex, very difficult to QA, and uh, really fixes require patches to the client. So, you know, players may not take the patches, different things like that. And really, at the end of the day, there's no guarantee that we won't introduce further knock-ons into the system. So that's why uh, when Dragon Age Inquisition was coming out, we thought that we needed to look forward for a better solution and really preserve that investment that our fans have made into the franchise. The really big problem for us came with the uh, launch of the next-gen consoles, meaning that as players switch to new ones, those choices, all that investment would be left behind. And that's where we came with the world vault. So like I said, the import logic was really the Achilles heel of the system. And solving this through a normal save import system was merely going to create the same types of problems. So the challenge for our team was to build a future-proof solution, something that would preserve our players' data after sunset of the different games, or you lose a particular console, or just decide to switch over, as well as we needed the ability to support any platform and multiple clients. And I'll talk a little a bit about kind of the concept of the franchise ecosystem and why we wanted to be able to support all these different things. So here's kind of what 
the world vault looks like at its basic. So what we did was we worked with the game team to identify key choices against all the different games from Dragon Age Origins, Dragon Age 2, and Inquisition. Then we coupled that with the plot logic and the rules behind each of them, and then we created a technology called the Auto Solver. This was the ability to solve for plot conflicts. So essentially what it does is it looks at what choices players are making and says, okay, well you can't make this particular choice, but let me find the next available option for you. This is what we all combined into what's called the World Vault. And the key here is that no matter what players do, they always have a valid world state. So they can't get into kind of a weird position where there's import errors and different things like that. Finally, what we needed was for clients to be able to read what they care about. So if you created a different companion experience or you're looking at importing into Dragon Age Inquisition, that game or that client only reads what they care about. So we can have any number of these, and we'll show you when we get to the interactive story summary kind of how we manage to pull that off. But uh, here's our system diagram. So really to solve for all this, the world vault needed to abstract the logic and the choices from the clients, and we moved them into the web. So for us, we have a system called Orbit, and it stores all of our online systems, of which the World Vault is one of them. So both the game and the keep read and write to Orbit, and that way, when we need to make changes to the plot system or the logic, we can do so outside of the game client, which gives us a ton of flexibility in fixing errors, and moving forward, we can use different experiences to tie in from this perspective. So when we look at the world vault and how the plot flags and the solver work, I'll kind of give you a bit more of a tangible example. It's simplified a little bit, but we have, um, if you're trying to figure out, let's say, what happened to the warden at the end of Dragon Age Origins, it's going to depend on a few different plots. Uh, again, this is a simplified example, but we have who killed the archdemon. It could have been the warden, Alistair Loghain. And did Morgan have a baby? Uh, no, yes, with the warden, with Alistair, with Loghain. So in order to make this valid, we have to figure out these preconditions. So if the warden ended up sacrificing him or herself, the warden couldn't have had a baby with Morgan. Obviously, gender also has an impact on this. But if the warden's alive or well, then Morgan didn't have a baby, and either Alistair or Loghain killed the archdemon. So to kind of uh, make this a little bit easier to see, this is how we took it into the keep, and uh, it should show you basically how the auto solver works to take those rules and precondition logic and say, okay, I'll find you an example of what we need to do next. So here I'm just uh, selecting uh, Alistair. You can see that it wants to change the state of my warden if I make that choice. But you can say, no, I don't want to do that, and my warden remains dead. But if you go back and decide to get, say, okay, I'd like to change my warden to alive and well, it's going to ask for Alistair to be killing the archdemon. It could also have low gain, but we auto solver finds kind of the least path of resistance when it's doing this. So now when you look and we add the Morgan baby question in, I can go ahead and select that, and it's going to say, okay, great, you can do that, but your warden is going to then sacrifice to the archdemon. And if I accept that, you can see that it's now changed the warden to being alive and well, and the uh, archdemon to being killed by the warden. So what this means is that players can essentially make one or 300 choices across all the different franchises, and the uh, world state is always valid and intact. So this was a really great example of how we kind of took the, uh, the uh, world vault and then made it translatable and have uh, something that other people can use and sort of easier to understand. But we first had to kind of look at the results of the world vault and that the client no longer needs to do any logical calculations to figure this out. So that means that players are able to use their save game on any platform, as well as carry over what's important to the franchise. Uh, the logic is independent of the client, which is a big bonus as well as the auto solver can manage any knock-ons and dependencies, and we have the ability to update that on the web. So when we take a look, uh, choices really do matter to people, and I kind of like this quote uh, because it says that, you know, whether they're small things you're capturing or larger things, that this makes a difference for people and their experience with the game. 
So that kind of brings us to our concept of the franchise ecosystem. So really, the strength of Dragon Age as a franchise exists not only in the games, the story, the choices that you make, but in all the other experiences across the franchise. We have comic books, novels, the fantastic little plush Mumbari hounds, and we have a really amazing active community devoted to this franchise. So really, when we took a look at developing the keep features for the keep, it's really about respecting the things that have come before, which fans have made an investment in. And out of the cross-platform challenge came the opportunity for us to preserve our fans' investment, engagement, and emotional connection across the franchises. So I'll show you really quickly our um, kind of our keep trailer, something that we came out with to show off what the keep's all about. And I'll press play. Hopefully it works. Nope. <laughs> You're probably asking yourself, what is the Keep? It's your way to discover, shape, and share your Dragon Age experience as you obsess over more than 300 choices from the previous two games. Ensure your Thetis is exactly as you left it, only maybe this time you're a dwarf and your hawk was sassy. You can do that. And because it's a free web app, you can use it on your console, PC, tablet, phone, or really any device with an HTML5 capable browser and an internet connection. Sorry, potatoes. Sit back and listen as Brian Bloom, the voice of Varric, recounts major events from Thetis, where you stood by and did nothing like a little Logan. Or maybe you're a goody two-shoes and like to help people. That's your call. Then, after everything is set, you can import it into Dragon Age Inquisition. And that's it. Now you're ready to play on your platform of choice. So, you know, go play it. Boom. Great. So that kind of takes you through some of um, more of our high-level features, but we really push for being available on all different devices using responsive design. And I think that uh, was a really big bonus for us in terms of the future proofing of the solution and having this available. So in terms of uh, the tapestry, which you kind of got a look at before, uh, this is really the cornerstone of the world vault and how we translated this into the user experience. So for us, the big challenge on this one was to allow players to customize their world states, make conflicts and knock-ons less confusing to navigate, as for new players to the franchise or people who are less familiar with the intricacies of this, this would be incredibly difficult to manage, as well as create an experience, not a tool, and cater to new and existing fans. So something we really wanted to do was make sure that this was uh, easy to use by a whole bunch of people. So this is the very first uh, look at what it was like to interact with the World Vault. It was a series of checkboxes. Uh, it's not very user-friendly or intuitive, and players who might not remember their choices would have probably a difficult time navigating this. So in the process, we worked with uh, an external company, Work at Play, to help us sort of look at how to get this off the ground. And we came up with some ideas, we did some research on this, and this is really similar to, I think, how many people would go about developing it. We did prototyping, so tested it with users, as well as development when we were finally okay with some of the mechanics and how this was going to work. When we refined the concept, we added the art in, it made a massive difference. But then we needed to go to the beta program. And this was really because we hadn't solved all the challenges that we had with this feature. When you look at it, it may be somewhat simple, but it was very complex to navigate. It was hard to understand. And we knew that we needed to reach out to our fans to say, how can we make this better? And what can we do to really make this your story and your world? So with the tapestry in this very early stage, uh, we knew we were on the right track that the complex logic was simplified to the player, whereas in the checklist version, this was not something we could easily simplify, as well as the imagery aided in the memory of the plot. So it was kind of an extra benefit, but something that made a big difference. And we were able to take what was developed and start the beta program. And I think that as a smaller team, this was a huge benefit to us to get something to a point where it was stood up enough that players could understand what we were trying to get at and then hopefully push it forward. 
So when we had sort of our initial beta feedback first impression survey, what we found was that people thought it was a lot more than they expected. They, they did think we were going to have a list of check boxes. And they were really impressed by the art style. I think that stood out beyond kind of the initial feedback we got was some of the biggest pieces. Now in terms of the interactive story summary, uh, this is kind of why we needed to make this feature. This is the total number of valid world states that you're able to create in the keep. There are so many of them, I think we did calculations, there's no way that you can just sit through and do this all by yourself. So for us, the challenge was to really help people get caught up on the Dragon Age story so far, as well as set a few high-level choices in real time. We needed it to work across modern browsers and devices without using plugins. This was a big thing for us. As you saw, we wanted to target responsive design, have this work on all these devices, and having animations like this in the browser is, of course, technically quite challenging. We also had, uh, we wanted to be localized in eight different languages with French, German audio. Uh, this is because this is sort of what Dragon Age Inquisition did and we wanted to match them. Again, it was quite the technical challenge. So we came up with the experience that we wanted to have for this. And that was that people would basically see an introduction module, then they would be able to edit their decisions in real time when playing it. So if they decided that they wanted to go with what the world vault had already set or how their world state was already set up, they could do that. And if not, if they would play the introduction again versus the outcome. So it was really quite simple. But the reason that we did this, and then it moved on to the next module introduction, but the reason that we did this was because in the future, as these modules expand, we can take and remove them out. And this gives us a ton of flexibility going forward to ensure that our interactive story summary doesn't become three hours when new games come out. So the process for this was a little bit simpler than the tapestry. We really knew what we wanted and we were able to develop the script, create art assets, set up the ISS in the world vault with those filters, provide the API endpoints to our external development team at G Skinner, and then they were able to help us create the player and the animations and we integrated it back into the keep. This was really valuable for us as a smaller team because what we could do was continue to work on development while people created experiences based on what was in the world vault. This was really very, very helpful for us. And the hardest part was really integrating it back into the keep at the end of the day. But we were ha very, very happy with the outcome. So here's a quick video demonstration. Um, all the animations are done HTML5 using vector images. And you're able to edit all the choices in real time. So I'll show you a quick example of how this works. And you're able to press play. If you believe the stories, mankind's pride gave rise to the dark spawn. With the traitorous Loghain now seated on Ferelden's throne, the Warden sought help from the influential Arl Eamon of Redcliffe. However, they arrived in Redcliffe to find the town under siege. As each night, undead rose in waves and assailed the battered village. With the hero's help, the people of Redcliffe stood fast against the undead horde. The wardens reached all. So you can see there that players are able to make choices in real time, and then it adjusts what's on the tapestry. So the two things kind of talk to each other. So we learned a few lessons when we were developing this. One, that integrating with the World Vault is straightforward and it allows for standalone development. That means that in the future, other types of companion experiences or products can hook into the World Vault and it makes it very easy to sort of extend what we're able to do. Uh, the player technology can easily be adapted for future needs. As well as we were able to hit our technical challenges with loading in the browser, working on consoles, and that was a big feat. And the Varric narration was a big hit with fans. This was one of the things that in our early beta program, people kind of called out and speculated that we would do a feature like this and said, wouldn't it be great if Varric narrated it? And then when we ended up coming out with that, it was just so exciting and something we were really glad to see. So in terms of this, it's really a nice quote. Our intention originally was to help fans kind of brush up on the events of Dragon Age, but what we found was that people loved having their story narrated by Varric. So actually being able to have it 
personalized and customized was really big. And then what we also found was that people would really want to customize their tapestries and then watch the interactive story summary as a type of introduction to Dragon Age Inquisition. So we found that this feature, although we kind of wanted to solve one thing, we ended up really uh, answering to a few different use cases. And that kind of brings us to our community beta program. So while the ISS was under develop, we took the features that we already had in the keep, uh, the tapestry, we had a hero section, a career section, and we started on our community beta. And like I said, this was very early on in our process. I think we were about eight, 10 months to shipping out when we just kind of had the idea for what we wanted the keep to be. And to do this, we knew that we needed to get valuable feedback from a variety of fans. And we wanted to ensure that we were able to really work in an agile fashion and adapt to uh, what we were hearing. And this kind of was a challenge for our team, but something that was really big was that we were able to respond and do something with what feedback we were hearing. The other thing we wanted to look at was being able to manage the feedback with a small team. Again, you could get lots of feedback in, so having, we have one QA lead, basically looking at all these things was quite difficult, as well as preparing for load at launch. So we designed kind of a beta onboarding flow that might look a little bit complicated, but I think it worked really well for what we were doing. So what we asked people to do was log on, sign up uh, to the Keep beta, and once they were accepted, they would log on to this site, they would accept the NDA, and then we would have them basically move over to the Bioware forums where we prepared kind of a welcome post that talked about you know, what the beta program was about, the different expectations we had, uh, how to give feedback. So it was really kind of an introduction to what we were looking for. And I highly suggest if you're doing a beta program or something similar to kind of have something like this out there to help people set the tone and why you're doing this program. Then after you got to read a whole big uh, uh, introduction post, we asked you to confirm your participation. And this may seem like an extra step, but we really wanted people to know what we were asking of them and, and let them know that you know if you want to participate, that's great. If you don't, that's totally fine too. So from there, we have this wait step. And this step was mainly for our team, and I'll show you in the next slide kind of how we needed this step to help us onboard people onto the keep while making sure that we could still do regular releases. And once you finish the wait step, uh, you would receive a welcome email, and then you'd be able to access the keep and the beta forums. So these tools we really used uh, to help people kind of get into the flow. It kept our team uh, uh, freed up to make sure that we didn't get too many people all at once signing up and coming in. So this was really, really important to us. So for our process, we used agile development and we went in two week release cycles. So every two weeks we would try and put out something new on the keep, as well as we would do cohort based invites. So we would look at everyone who would apply, look at how far along the keep was, and then invite them in based on specific criteria. We also used open discussions. This was all done on the Bioware forums. So these kind of changed and took shape as we move forward in the process. And we also needed entire dev team involvement. So our team actively participated on the forums with the beta uh, participants to say, okay, what do you think of this? And really got involved. This was something our team loved doing and it was incredibly rewarding and positive. So when we looked at kind of how our week broke out because we were doing these two week cycles, on Tuesday we would always try and hit our release where we would post our release notes, we would start new open discussions and close out old open discussions. So our open discussions would be around things like, how do you think we can improve this? Or in this particular section, what would you like to see here? And they were more of a guideline to say, you know, how would we like to get feedback and really help us move our sort of development roadmap in the right direction. And then we would close off discussions that we didn't want to have anymore. Uh, then we would send out invites uh, to uh, participants and announce them typically on Twitter. And then the next week we would start onboarding all of our new participants as well as collecting feedback and adjusting priorities. So if we would see major bugs come up or things similar to that, we would investigate using typically surveys or things like that to say, okay, who's having problems? How can we get a hold of you? As well, we would monitor for different feedback and trends we were seeing. 
So when we looked at getting feedback, we used a beta feedback button in the Keep. This was to allow us to have continuous feedback and feedback in the moment. And I'll show you in the next slide kind of how this worked for us. We also use the Bioware forms very like, heavily to have our open discussions, but we always kept them fairly restricted in terms of what uh, participants were allowed to do. They weren't allowed to create their own discussions, and this really helped us keep control of sort of the scope of everything. As well, we used Google Analytics. It was a great tool for us, uh, mainly just to monitor site traffic, do some comparisons and then surveys when we needed them. We didn't do them too often, but it was more to collect additional insights. Um, we needed a dedicated email account for troubleshooting. We also installed a role gating system on the Keep. This helped us with a few different things, but one of them is that we can allow different cohorts the ability to see different features as they were going through beta. So if we knew something was gonna be particularly uh, troublesome or maybe we needed a little bit more help on certain areas, we wouldn't release them uh, as broadly, but we would take small feedback, uh, get the bugs fixed, and then release it uh, larger out. Finally, we uh, had a Twitter and a Twitch account. Uh, this was really important for us, both as we got towards launch and we started to need to communicate quite a bit more in terms of where the keep was, what was happening, and it gave us, especially Twitch, a vehicle for people to ask questions, uh, us to demo features while we were still in beta, and I think that gave us a bit of a jump start on what to do uh, when we got to launch, the kind of questions to expect and the trouble to expect. So here's kind of the beta feedback button. And the really great thing about this button was it allowed uh, our participants to give us feedback kind of at any point in time. So they were able to select uh, feedback from the menu. And then what you would do is be able to select specific feedback and choose an area on the keep that you wanted to let us know about. So from there, we had this little emotional indicator, which we used quite a bit to help us find things that weren't uh, as good or things that people were liking. As well, we were able to segment um, our feedback based on the types of things that we saw that people were giving us. And this really helped us in terms of scalability on the feedback. So you were able to select the different things that you wanted to tell us about. And then we would get them all kind of on the back end of the keep. And we kept a dashboard running up at our office showing all the different feedback that was coming in continuously. So this was incredibly helpful for us um, it, even to take things like localization feedback, and it was one of the bigger things that we used on the Keep. So this was sort of the culture that developed around the beta program that was something that we really wanted to make feel truly collaborative. We wanted to listen to people and make sure that their ideas got integrated into the Keep. The team actively posted and communicated in release updates about what we'd heard and how the team addressed it. And when we didn't, we weren't able to fix things, we let people know why. So in terms of our beta program phases, each phase was designed to help us get the most out of where we were in development. So during alpha, we had a lot of things that we just needed people to help us give an idea of how to close them off, how to make them better. One of the big suggestion changes that came out of this phase was helping us solve conflicts. We talked about an open discussion and someone said, well, why don't you just show the things that I've changed instead of an entire giant list of everything you've changed? And this really helped us completely solve a problem that we'd had since the very beginning. So I think during our alpha phase, this is really what we looked for. We had limited participation, so we could kind of be very hands-on, and we hadn't firmed up our development roadmap, so there was lots of room to move and shift. Uh, we started our Twitter account about this time, and we also introduced a talk about the Keep program. So while we were in beta, the Keep was under NDA. We asked people not to share pictures, don't uh, talk about it publicly. But if people wanted to, they could contact us and say, I have a blog, a YouTube channel, and I'd really like to do this. And we would just work with them to make sure that that was something we were okay and we could put out. And this was really helpful for us, uh, both going towards launch and kind of getting the community to know about uh, the keep from someone that wasn't us, essentially. Then we moved into our closed beta, and we did our first public reveal around PAX. And this is where we changed over the site that was very gray to the more colorful one. So we had been working kind of in tandem behind the scenes with all the feedback that we were getting, and we revealed this all at PAX. 
So from there, what we kind of looked at was feedback more around how do we improve some of the small things to make it better. We added a randomized world state button. Uh, we added the ability to, uh, or, well, we did that now. We have the now ability to add hero biographies, but it was something that came up during this phase. So we looked for the really kind of quick hit things that we could do that made a big difference, but wouldn't necessarily severely alter what we were doing. We also uh, started a friends and family beta program as we had many people who wanted their, their friends or their family to be able to come check out the Keep, and this was a really easy way to get some extra people in. Finally, we moved into open beta, and we started our regular Twitch Q&A sessions. Uh, our focus around open beta was more scalability at launch, making sure that what we had worked and that it worked well and would hold through when we launched. We also knew that people who had created world states, they'd be able to put them into Dragon Age Inquisition. So there was kind of the, uh, it was sort of both preparation for launch as well as making sure that people were also ready for their Dragon Age launch ahead of time and that we didn't have everyone flood in all at once. So finally for Keep Launch, we had unrestricted access, uh, we decided to close out the beta forums and really transition over to more of the open style beta or forums that the BioWare forums have right now. And then in terms of the beta program results, uh, this is something that we are really excited about because before we were even in the hands of public right at launch time, we'd had 6.5 million sessions on the keep and 350,000 world states created. People could create more than one world state. So at the end, we had about 300,000 beta program signups, which was really big for us. Uh, we didn't expect to have so much, as well as almost 50,000 items of feedback received through the beta feedback button. And we we're averaging about 575 per day. So there was uh, certainly a significant amount of feedback we were getting. We also had about 85,000 unique users on the Keep forums. And I think this was great with our original goal of having people be collaborative, check into these open discussions, and we never really had any major flare-ups on the forums. This was kind of great to see so many people participating in this. As well with our uh, talk about the Keep program, we also got a lot of uh, YouTube views and collaborations. So I think this was a really important thing for us because while we were under NDA and it was secret, we were also able to help the community talk about the Keep and get more word out about what it is as it was quite a different thing at the time and you know how to use it. There was lots of helpful guides, so we really couldn't thank the community enough for sort of putting all that into what we were doing. As well, we ended up with about 10,000 social mentions during launch, and this was really neat for us to see uh, so much, I guess, word of mouth and chat about the keep uh, right up to launch because the more people that came in earlier on, the better prepared we were for launching. Uh, so that was really awesome. Uh, so here I'm going to show you basically what the keep looked like uh, when we went into alpha. So you can see it was quite gray. Um, you had to click on all the different tiles and then click back out of them again uh, to use the site, which was a big pain for a lot of beta users commenting on. So we just had little usability things that we wanted to work on. As well, resolving conflicts, this was, again, one of our bigger challenges when looking at the keep. And you used to get this big long list of essentially everything that was going to change. And it might not make that much sense to you. As well, managing world states was done basically in a little list format because you could have, at the time, about five world states. Uh, we changed it to 10 based on feedback. So you can see that we had a really far way to go. And looking at the feedback, this was kind of the main themes that started to pop up. And we really focused on kind of this theme-based approach to say, how do we get this to the right spot? So one of the things that came up massively was color. So people liked the, the imagery. They found the, it evocative and it worked well. But the color was a bit sad. And so that's sort of one of the things that we looked at. As well, syncing. Syncing was huge. We uh, sync with your career data as well as your heroes. And having your custom wardens or hawks show up on the keep meant a lot to people. And we had to do a ton of work on the back end to get this fixed up to a sort of manageable state considering Origins came out in 2009. So we're, we're working with quite old data. And then I 
termed another category was details. No music or sound. So it's these, the little touches that really made it more and bigger and a better experience that we were just missing in there. So I, I quite like the comment about no music or sound whatsoever. And we did eventually end up adding sound. Uh, I had to convince the developers that that was an okay thing to add to a website, but we added it. And then choices. I think in the beginning, around 90% of our feedback was about the amount of choices we had. We'd started really with just what you needed to get into Dragon Age Inquisition. But people found that this wasn't enough. This didn't capture their world. And so what we needed to do was basically take that beta feedback button, we had the plot suggestion, and we worked with the creative team to say, okay, here's what we're hearing, can we add these in? And I think we, ad we added a significant amount of new plots, and they, some of them even ended up being in Dragon Age Inquisition. So while you're maybe not able to have everything poured over to the next new game, people wanted to capture sort of the breadth and the depth of their story. And that's one of the big, big learnings that we had coming out of doing this that sort of shifted where the product was going in general. So here's where we decided to go. Um, in terms of color, we added a lot of it. And I know that this looks quite different from what we had before, and it was a little bit nerve-wracking because we developed it in secret and then released it out to everyone to say, thank you so much, here's what we did. Uh, Generally, the feedback ended up really positive, and it was so exciting to see uh, iPhone screen backgrounds show up with the art, and we did t-shirts with the art, and it was really exciting. I think something that fans, although it was a little scary at first, uh, ended up connecting with. You can see we added a few other things uh, based solely on feedback. Uh, the addition of the banners to designate the different products. Small thing, but really helped the usability. As well, we moved around the navigation from the different sides. And probably late in the game, we added the ability to see if your world state had been exported to Dragon Age Inquisition or not. Very early on with that world state manager, the little thing that popped out of the side and was kind of just a list, people didn't realize what world state they were working on. And this could be very dangerous for us when people imported the wrong one into Dragon Age Inquisition. So both based on internal feedback from the QA team as well as kind of hints that we got throughout the beta that I'm not sure people know how world states work and how it's switching. We made some pretty substantial changes to the section, which I'll show you next. But first, uh, this modal, although very small, was certainly one of the things that tripped us up quite a bit. And you can see it's much smaller in terms of we only show the choices that you decided to make or change, not the entire list of them. We also added in the images so that you could easily at a glance see what we were changing. And it's some other helpful things such as question mark button that tells you why we're changing things on you. So this was really um, kind of one of our bigger things that we needed to solve but something that we were able to do with the help of the beta team. Uh, as well, here's kind of what you saw before in the video was that world state manager with the little slide out panel uh, with the kind of list of five world states. What we decided to do was change this section to actually show the current world state you were on as well as the connection, like what you were going to import into Inquisition. So we had the hero and a few little summary choices. So it was kind of this safeguard against maybe importing the wrong state. Uh, what we found early on in the alpha group was that people, or the alpha stage, was that people were telling us that their heroes have a massive connection to their world states. So we started to pull in their heroes into a lot of the different places of the keep to be sort of the cornerstone or the mark to who you were importing in. As well, you have kind of our big check mark DAI. We're exporting this in. Um, which was kind of that safeguard and we were able to message and put out on Twitter that if you think you have something and maybe you don't check that you have this big check mark in your keep and that's, uh, that means you're good and you're safe and you imported what you wanted. So something that we really needed to do and kind of I think was one of the big things at launch that helped us make sure that people had their right world states in the keep. The other thing that we did was we moved the entire world state section into um, its own brand new kind of interface. And that's because people really wanted to have more than five world states. We couldn't accommodate it in the small panel we had before. 
But in this way, people were able to either drag or edit their world states in the tapestry, and it gave a better sense of what I was working on. I had to physically, tangibly move something or do something to start working on a different world state. Whereas before, you just had to click on a little eyeball button that was really, people didn't know what that meant. So I think that this was, again, a big thing, and it also allows us in the future to add more world states or add different sections. So a really great thing that we got from kind of the small hints and the themes that we were hearing out of the beta program. And finally, the details. I really love this uh, piece here. This is one of my favorites about dog. And when we went through the beta, wanting to add and give things more life and more personality, we found that one of the cool things that we could do was rewrite all the text in the keep. Uh, the creative director, Mike Laidlaw, wrote all the text himself, so a big thank you to him. And it just gave everything kind of that storybook feel, whereas it used to say, did you recruit dog? Yes or no? So this was a big, big thing that we added. And it seems small, but again, these details, they made a massive difference in the experience and what we are trying to achieve. So I love this quote as well because it, it really speaks to kind of the keep evolved. So these people who are with us uh, during our beta program, they got to see it move from basically this gray piece that had interesting usability problems and some confusing sections into something that was workable for a wide variety of fans. And we were so excited to have them involved as well. So kind of the lessons that we learned coming out of this is to design a program around what your product needs. I think it's quite um, simple to say, but you know we had a really long time span. We knew where we were with the product, and maybe if we were closer to launch or we had a more firm timeline, this would have been a lot harder to do. So really take a look at what your product needs, where you want to get to, and then really get feedback in the moment. This was huge for us because as we launched things, as we put out new releases, we could see what was really vexing for people. As well, encourage your whole team to get involved. I hope that this was something that you know our, my team would want to be a part of, and just to see them get on the forums, to talk to people, to say from a developer's perspective why a feature couldn't be implemented or why something didn't work well was really big, and it was something that then the community could go talk about, and it was um, really genuine and authentic, and we tried our best to kind of do that. And then finding the common themes and investigate. Like I said, we had a massive amount of feedback, tons and tons of feedback. So we had to work really, really hard on how to categorize this, how to make this actionable, how to find out what people are really looking for, and then investigate and dig in when we needed more information. As well, communicate openly during the process. I think that we spent a lot of time uh, putting up release notes saying, what we heard, what we changed, and what we were going to do next. And we always tried to kind of toe that line between uh, things that we could do and couldn't do and wanted to do versus you know, what we were actually able to do and making sure to communicate that openly and honestly. And I think that was a big thing that kind of helped uh, get us to where we were with the Keep, to get uh, where we were in terms of some of the features, the things that we couldn't get done, uh, you know, sort of prepared for it launch. So this was a big, big point for us. And then at the end, what we did was we put up a credit section with all the people who decided to help us. Uh, we did use a survey so that people could tell us uh, what name they wanted in there. And this was something that, um, again, I, I just loved being able to say, like, you absolutely helped us get here with your work, your feedback, based on something that was, uh, you know, probably a year prior, a list of checkboxes. So uh, that was, again, really, really special. So I encourage you to, if you do something like this and you're able to, give credit where credit's due. And finally, some final thoughts. So for us, don't just solve the immediate problem, find the opportunities. We absolutely could have gone with a list of checkboxes. You could have used that as your world state and imported it into Dragon Age Inquisition, but we wanted to respect our fans' investment, their engagement, their time with the franchise, and build something that would be there for them in years to come. As well, preserve the investment your fans have made in your franchise. Whether it's choices, progress, anything, those things can help carry them through to your next game, your next experience, and it really represents what they've put into your franchise. 
As well, find ways to include your community in the development process. I can't say enough about this. This was huge for us, and it was an incredibly rewarding experience, and something that I really hope that if you're looking at considering uh, something that you'll just do is that it does really help take your product in a really great direction. And finally, uh, if I have time for questions. And thank you again all so much for coming out today. I really, really appreciate it. And I don't know if I have time for questions, but you could ask them. Eight minutes, okay. Hi. I was wondering what was your like and what kind of adoption were you targeting? Like, do you know how many Inquisition states got imported? Yes, so um, in terms of what we were looking for and what we got, uh, the analytics team is still working on some numbers, so I can't officially say we do know for um, origin pre-orders only, it was about 50%. So again, uh, we didn't have massive sort of goals in terms of adoption, but really this was something that we felt we needed to do. And if it helped people get ready for inquisition, that was great. But what we're finding now actually is that people are using it more for their second or third playthroughs because they can get a different experience in inquisition. So that's kind of what we're digging into to try and figure out a bit more about. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, just a, hi, a very quick question. Sorry, my voice is kind of dead due to the AC here. Uh, but uh, it does look like the Keep is the most comprehensive sort of storybook of all the Dragon Age experiences right now. But what was the product-oriented goal or pressure from the Inquisition team to include very specific things or maybe prioritize them in the Keep? Yeah, so I think up until launch, our kind of razor was help fans prepare for Inquisition, like help them get their world states into Inquisition. And that was really kind of the big driving goal for us. So when we had to look at other interesting features or things that we had on the back burner, kind of if it didn't help fans get ready for Dragon Age Inquisition, that it kind of got shuffled off to the side. So that was, I think, our main kind of goal going forward to launch, as well as we did have sort of our more product goals around creating the franchise ecosystem, preserving our players' data. But yes, when it came to the game, get players ready to play. Yep. Great. Okay, awesome. Well, if there's no further questions, again, thank you all so much for coming out. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope you had uh, fun and learned a few things today. All right, take care.